Thank you very much. Thanks, Jan. Yes, um, I'm Andrew Elliott. Um, and I've worked all my life in um, jobs that have required a certain degree of numeracy. So a lot of stuff in IT, um, a lot of stuff in insurance. And I've always regarded myself as, as a numerate person. And I suppose this whole project came about from frustration at seeing the way numbers are handled in the media and in politics and in public life in general. And it seemed to me that, you know, sit your teeth on edge sometimes, some of the stuff you, you hear and you read, um, in the way that numbers are handled. And sometimes there's, it's matters of subtlety and, and, and the way in which the, 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 um, the things are presented. Sometimes it's very, very basic. Sometimes it's just a question of people not understanding what the scale of a certain um, problem is. And some small issues get magnified, large issues get, 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 get minimized. And it got me to thinking that sometimes the question that just needs to be asked and answered is, is that a big number? And so I, as one does these days, I set up a website. And the website had one function only, and that is it's a single input field. You can type in a number and press a button that says, is this a big number? And it goes and it compares it to a whole bunch of reference numbers that it's got in the database. And it comes back and says, yes, it's 10 times the diameter of, Ju of Jupiter or something like that. You know, it's, it, it, all it does is it goes back, retrieves the number, and brings up some, some pleasant, entertaining comparisons. But doing that work made me think about the way in which we regard numbers, the way in which we relate to numbers, the way in which we understand numbers, and big numbers in particular. Um, and having thinking about it, I started writing some of this down, and hence the book which you see here. So today is all about numbers. It's not maths, it's about numbers, and the way in which we think about and relate to numbers. Um, I mean, you guys, Google, you're the masters of big data. But today I want to talk a little bit about what you could do with just a little bit of data, and not with high-tech processing of data, but just the stuff that you've got in your heads, just thinking about numbers and thinking about how we relate to numbers and how we understand numbers. So how numbers help us understand the world. Now, you may think I'm being metaphorical there, but I'm not. I'm going to start off by literally talking about the size of the Earth. And I was always told that when you do a talk like this, you start with the ancient Greeks. Well, there's your ancient Greek, Eratosthenes. Now, you may know him because of his connection with um, prime numbers. You know, Eratosthenes' sieve is a way of filtering out the compound numbers, leaving behind only the prime numbers. But he was much more than that. He was, in fact, the third chief librarian at the famous library at Alexandria. Um, and put yourself in his position. He's there. This is a relatively recent institution. It's been founded after the conquests of Alexander the Great, 200 BC. The scope of the world, has, his world, has expanded because of this. And he's dealing with new information coming in from all over the place. And he's trying to assimilate this information. He's trying to manage it. He's trying to pull it into um, um, a, a form of a framework. He's trying to aggressively collect this information and deal with it. Does that sound familiar at all to you guys? So there he is. He's running the Library of Alexandria, and he's trying to make sense of the world. And he's using numbers to do this. Now, that's a map that he made, or it's a reproduction of a map that he made, um, of his known world. And he's known as the parent of scientific geography. And while we may look at that map and think that's a little bit dodgy, um, it represents only about 8% of the globe as we know it. Um, and it's seriously deficient when you get down to the south. You'll find that. That word over there on the bottom says equator. Um, and he runs out at, at round about India over to the, to, the, to the right there. And let's forget about what's going on to the west. But that was his known world. But there's a lot that's going on there that's right. So you can see around the Mediterranean basin, there are some familiar shapes there. That stuff. I mean, put yourself in this guy's position. He doesn't have surveys. He doesn't have telecommunications. He doesn't have measuring devices. He's building this from, from stories. Um, and the, in, the thing that he introduced here are these lines of latitude and longitude. So what he's doing is he's using numbers to put these things into the right place. Now, the two points that are particularly of interest here, that's where he is in Alexandria there on the Nile Delta. 
And down below, down south, there's a place called Sayin, which is, if you can read the word that says tropic, it's on the Tropic of Cancer. And that means that that on the summer solstice in Sayin, the sun would have been overhead. So that is what he used to measure the Earth. Now that's not Eratosthenes, that's Carl Sagan. But he's showing you the technique that Eratosthenes used. So you can see there, in Syene, there's a column, and there up in Alexandria, there's a column. Now, when the sun is directly overhead in Syene on the summer solstice, the column casts no shadow. The sun sh shines directly down a web shaft, uh, a web shaft, a well shaft. Um, whereas in the uh, same day in Alexandria, there is a shadow that's being cast. Now, this is because of the curvature of the Earth, of course, and that let him calculate the size of the Earth. Geometry, of course, it comes from the Greek. Everything comes from the Greek. Well, not everything, but it's a measurement of Earth or land. So he's measuring the Earth. The units he's using are feet, podes, and if you like, foot races. A stadion was the length of a stadium, and it's around 200 meters um, in, in today's terms. And he had a measurement there from Alexandria to Syene of 5,000 stadia. If I look on Google Maps, I see that's approximately 850 kilometers. So you can get the equivalence there. And of course, we understand geometry in a different way as well, as um, shapes and scales and sizes. And so there's a bit of geometry for you. There's some parallel lines coming in the rays of the sun. In the southern location in Syene, you can see that it's falling directly in line with a the column there. Up in Alexandria, there's a, there's a a shadow being cast. And if you remember your geometry from school, that angle there must be the same as the angle there. So if he measures the angle in, in Alexandria, he can work out what proportion of the circle of the Earth that represents. And he measured it to be 1 50th. Multiply the two together, and you've got 250,000 stadia. In our terms, about 42,500 kilometers. Now, that's pretty accurate. For the time and for the techniques, that's very accurate. And there are a couple of things I just wanted to point out here. One is that he's using very simple mathematics to do this. There's only a few data points that he needs. Secondly, he's got a big picture. He's got a view of what's going on. He's got a concept of what's going on here that he can put those numbers into. And the third thing I want to mention is quite a subtle point in a, in a way. We saw his map of the known world, 8% of the globe. So that was all that he knew about in terms of places and peoples and things like that. But he also knew that the world was that much bigger. So he knew how much he didn't know. Um, and I think that's an interesting thing to think about. Now we jump forward some 1,600 years to a fellow called Toscanelli in Florence. He's also an astronomer. He's also a mathematician. He's also a geographer. He was one of the guys behind the um, development of the mathematical theory of perspective in the Renaissance. Um, he was involved in the building of the Duomo in Florence. And he's also dealing with a flood of in new information, because this is after Marco Polo's voyages to the Far East. And in fact, he spoke to the first merchant after Marco Polo, a guy called Niccolo de Conti, and he got stories from this guy, and he was also trying to assimilate this information and pull it together. And he, too, made a map. And when he looked at his map, and when he thought about this, he was convinced that you could reach the east by sailing west. And guess what? He sent that map to Columbus. And it's a map that Columbus relied upon. Now, there in orange, you can see what his map looked like. And behind it, you can see what the reality looks like. And I think you can see the problem. He thought that the ocean between Europe and the east was about 130 degrees of the globe. In fact, it's about 210 degrees. There was a whole chunk of Earth that was missing, as far as he was concerned. And of course, the rest is history. Um, Columbus ended up in the New World, as he thought of it at that time. And in fact, that's what Toscanelli wrote. The ocean to be crossed is not great. Therefore, by bringing up a Dentilio, the Asiatic coast is easily reached. 
well, numbers make a difference, yeah? So Eratosthenes, around 40,000. Toscanelli and Columbus were working to around 30,000, 25% difference. Now, it's easy to romanticize this and think of the, the ancient, wise old ancient being the guy who got it right. But you've got to admit there's some dodgy numbers floating around there. The 5,000 stadia, exactly. The 1 50th of the globe, exactly. You know, maybe he got lucky, but still he got the right answer. Well, that, you know, and, 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 or something close to the right answer. So, um, so there's that to be said. Now, if we look at what the actual measurements are, we get some two numbers there, one around the equator, one over the poles, and are slightly different, but they're both very, very close to 40,000 kilometers. And you may think, well, that's a bit dodgy, that's a bit close to a round number. And of course, that, you'd be absolutely right. And that comes from the, the definition, the original definition of the meter, which is one ten millionth of the distance from the pole to the equator, along the line going through Paris, of course. Um, and now we start getting into numbers that are not to do with body parts and how long you can walk. You're talking about measuring the globe and a numbering system that's derived from scientific measurements. And we start getting into what we might call big numbers. So I'm just going to take a moment now to think about what do we mean by a big number? What makes a big number? You know, 40,000 kilometers around the world. 350 million, a, lot, a number we've heard about a lot in the last few years, but very seldom is it asked, is that a big number? Um, seven and a half billion people in the world, you know, is that a big number? And I think there's a gap in our society, in our understanding, in the way we think about numbers here. So we go to school, we learn about numbers, we learn to count, we learn about bigger numbers than that. We go into hundreds, we go perhaps into thousands. We become very familiar with numbers in a fairly limited range. So, I mean, there's an example. Highest ever single innings test cricket score, 952 runs for six declared. Um, it's India versus Sri Lanka, Colombo, 1997. And I can imagine that number building up. I can imagine sitting and watching that match, and there'd be a six, and there'd be a four, and there'd be a couple of singles. And slowly that number would accumulate. I can grasp that process that takes me to that number. But it's almost slipping away from me. It's almost slipping away. It's, it's a big number in those terms. And now you have on the other side, you have these young scientists working in the lab. And for them, a big number may be a very different thing entirely. They may be thinking or taught about Avogadro's number. You know, 6.02 times 10 to the 23, the number, a mole, the number of carbon-12 atoms in 12 grams of carbon. That's a very big number. 600 billion trillion. And when I start saying billions and trillions, I've got to be careful not to trip over my words, because this is where confusion comes in. And of course, the scientists use that notation, scientific notation, and that's fine. They learn those techniques. They learn those, uh, those algorithms for working with those numbers, and everything is fine. But not everybody thinks in those terms. <coughs> and not all numbers are expressed in those terms. And in between those two, there is a gap. And we're talking about numbers that relate to government, <coughs> numbers that relate, relate to corporations, and resources, and populations. And these numbers are beyond the thousands. They're into the millions, billions, trillions. And you know, I have to watch myself, even now talking to you, not to say billion when I mean million <laughs> or trillion. And it's. It's confusing. And I don't think any of us really grasps numbers very well in that gap. We've got a good, a good understanding of small numbers. We've got techniques for dealing with very big numbers. But those only techniques. It's not really a, a relationship with those numbers. But in the middle, there are some, very, some important numbers. And they're important because we're called upon to make decisions based upon those numbers. So what I'm going to do today is really try and just focus on one of those numbers, the global population there, the last of those, and just try and bring that to life for you in, 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 a, in, a, in a simple way. I'm going to start by saying, how big is a billion? Well, we all know how big a billion is. It's a, a thousand billion since 1974 in this country. You know, 10 to the 9, 1 with 9 zeros, however you want to put it. 
we all know what a billion is, but can we imagine a billion? Can we conceive of a billion? We're going to get there. We're going to start with how big is a thousand. I wanted to make this come to life for myself. So I found up my kid at university and I said, can I play with your Lego? And I started building a Lego strip. There you go. That's the start of it. Ten yellow, ten white, ten yellow, ten white. Trying to build a strip a thousand Lego studs long. Too wide, of course, because that's how Lego comes. And there it goes. I'm going from outside the house into the house. You can see my toes sticking into the picture there. And so I go, and so I build that strip. And you can see in the right in the middle there, I put a little red brick just to mark the point. There's another, another view of it. Now, forgive me for flogging this, but I'm just trying to put it in context. I'm just trying to give you a physical idea of what a thousand looks like compared to one, one in a thousand, a thousand to one ratio. And there's the whole thing. And as you can see, I've numbered that up to, to, to prove it to myself. And there's a little brick in the middle to show you the, the one compared to a thousand. Now, it's also the length of the River Nile compared to the Oxford Cambridge Boat Race. 6,800 kilometers versus 6.8 kilometers. It's also the height of Kilimanjaro compared to a pole vault record. It's also the height of Niagara Falls when measured in pool balls. So just trying to give you some feel for, you know, a thousand, we, 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 we treat it so lightly, we dismiss it so easily, but it's actually quite a big number. It's a, if you look at your screen, you know, the, uh, one in a thousand is, is maybe one or two pixels on, across your screen. It's, 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 a thousand is a big number. But we're going to build up to a billion now. But it's, to build big, we need to start small. So we're going to start with a tiny little ant, just a four millimeter ant there. And that's our starting point. But we're going to now need to step to something a little bit bigger. Maybe we want a beetle. And there's your beetle. And just luckily, that happens to be about a thousand times bigger than the ant there. So imagine a thousand ants lined up alongside that Volkswagen Beetle. Now another step. What's going to be a thousand times bigger than a beetle? Well, it turns out that Central Park isn't a bad, a bad choice. Just over four kilometers, and very conveniently, it's set in a place where they number the streets. So there are 50 street blocks there from What's the time? 60th to 110th Street. That makes 80 meters per block. And you can imagine 20 beetles on each block of New York, bumper to bumper, jammed up all along Central Park West there. A thousand cars. And perhaps you can imagine each of those cars has got a thousand ants next to them. So now you've got a million ants going there. OK, so far so good. What's a thousand times bigger than Central Park? Turns out Australia's not a bad guess. <laughs> it's just over 4,000 kilometers east to west. Google Maps coming to my rescue there. Um, so that's 1,000 central parks stretching across Australia, coast to coast. It's a million beetles. Then it's a billion ants. So a billion ants to cross Australia. But I can't resist going one step further and closing the circle here. Because if we know that 1,000, 4,000 kilometers is the width of Australia, we also know that 40,000 is the equator. So 10 billion is going to take you a line of ants all around the world, circling the Earth. A little deviation here. How fast can we circle the Earth? Now, I don't know how good your Literate, uh, literacy, literature knowledge is, but there's an itinerary from a, from a book. And we're going from London, we're going via Hong Kong, we're going via San Francisco, we're ending up back in London. And the giveaway, of course, is the total there of 80 days. So this is the planned itinerary in Jules Verne's book, Around the World in 80 Days. That's how Phileas Fogg planned to get around the world and how he calculated that he could make it work. I found a map of the route that he took. And there are two things that are interesting about that to me. One is that it's by no means a straight line or even a great circle. It's, um, you know, he's, he's having to do a fair bit of zigzagging, especially around about Southeast Asia there. 
Um, and secondly, it's actually all almost entirely in the northern hemisphere. So the southernmost point there is Singapore, which is pretty much on the equator. And so for two reasons, well, there's, there's two counteracting forces here. One is he's, he's, he's going longer than 40,000 because he's going the zigzags, and he's going shorter because he's actually only going on the northern part of the Earth. So again, Google Maps came to my rescue. I measured those sort of point-to-point -point distances on key points there. And actually, it comes out not far off, 38,000 kilometers. So I reckon he, it, that was all right. So he could do around the world in 80 days. Steam and rail were his, what is driving him there. Now, Eratosthenes would have known that you could walk around the world in about 1,000 days, if you had a road, of course. Um, we can drive a bit faster than that. Last year, a fellow called Francois, um, oh, um, I can't think of the surname now, <laughs> a French sailor um, did a trip around the world, um, Gabar, Francois Gabar, uh, did a trip around the world in a trimaran. It took him 43 days to go around the world solo. A commercial flight, you can do it in two and a half days. And I checked up on this. You can take Air New Zealand from London to Auckland via Los Angeles, then two and a half hours on the ground um, in Auckland. And you can take a BA flight back via Sydney and Singapore. And it takes you exactly 60 hours, uh, two and a half days. A plane has actually, a B-52 bomber has actually flown around the world in 42 hours, refueling on flight. Um, the fastest plane that has flown is the Blackbird, uh, the recon plane. It didn't actually go around the world. It's, it did a 24,000 kilometer journey, 60% of the way, in about 10 and a half hours. So that would have been equivalent to going around in 17 and a half hours. And the International Space Station, of course, goes around about every hour and a half, so about 15 times a day. But then I came across one more measurement that I couldn't leave out, which was from Shakespeare. And he said that, he has Puck say in Midsummer Night's Dream, I'll put a girdle round about the earth in 40 minutes. And when I saw that 40, it <laughs> chimed with my 40,000. So there's 1,000 kilometers a minute, one megameter per minute. I think we should have a new unit of speed called a Puck. One th <laughs> <laughs> a megameter per minute. Anyway, that's a bit of a diversion. Let's talk about the number of people, the, 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 the seven and a half billion people. Now, you guys, I'm sure, all know all about this guy called Hans Rosling. Died, sadly, last year. A Swedish doctor, statistician, talker, thinker. Wonderful fellow. If you've not seen his uh, videos or read his book, Factfulness, go out and get it. It's, it's, it's a fantastic, fantastic book. Um, and this is him talking about the world's population. And in the first picture there, he's showing 7 billion people, as he had it at the time, and the age distribution of these people. So you've got 2 billion people under the age of 15, 2 billion children, 2 billion in the next tranche up to the age of 30, and then a billion, a billion, a billion going up to 75. And he's talking about the way in which population grows and the way in which it's a predictable thing. Um, and he says, what's happening now is that the number of children is not significantly increasing in the world. What's happening is that people are getting older. And so those columns are growing upwards, but the, the whole structure is not getting wider. So he's taking it there from 7 to 10 billion by aging those, pop, uh, um, those, 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 those young people. And that is the change that we're seeing in the world, and that is the way that the population is, is progressing. And he takes it a little bit further, and he says, yes, people are going to be living longer. And he's putting another block on top there to make it into 11 billion. Um, and that would cover the age you know, 75 to 90. This is obviously in very crude and simple terms. But nonetheless, it helps you to focus the mind. It helps you to think about these numbers. Um, in, in the background there, he's got a little chart based on the United Nations projection. And he talks about having reached peak child. In other words, for several decades now, the number of children in the world hasn't been increasing. What's been hap happening is that adults are getting older. More people are living to old age. And I mean, there's a whole discussion to be had here and a whole discussion around, 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 of the implications of this. I just want to pick out one thing here. And that is around 2050, around the middle of the century, we are going to pass 
the uh, number of 10 billion people in the world. Uh, whether we go beyond that, whether we, for, you know, uh, when we, uh, w whether it tops out, I d and uh, we're not talking about that here. Now, just a question of, at some point, we will hit 10 billion, and what will that look like? Now, we've already got a reference point for this. We've already covered this, because we know what 10 billion ants look like. So 10 billion ants wind their way around the world once. Now, I need a bit more space than an ant. If an ant gets four millimeters, maybe I need a meter. So if a line of people would then be 250 times as long, would wind around the Earth 250 times. Can we visualize that? Let's take some central parks. If we put 10,000 central parks around the world, Central Park is 850 meters across. That's enough space for 250 lines of people, and three meters between them. And that would be in a one million people sitting in each park. So one million people in 10,000 parks around the world. Is that realistic? Well, yes, I'm showing my age here. Yeah? But in 1981, Simon and Garfunkel reunion concert, they pulled 500,000 people onto the Great Lawn in Central Park. And they've had bigger crowds than that then since then. So there we are, pushing towards a million people in Central Park. Is that realistic? Yes, it is, to think about that. Have, uh, do our numbers agree? Yes, they do. Just a little few um, validity checks, and we can, we, we're, we're happy that we're in the right order of magnitude here. How dense are those people? It works out to about 300,000 per square kilometers in that situation. Now, obviously, we're not going to say that all the people in the world can accumulate at that density. But how densely can people live? Well, the place on the Earth with the greatest population density is Macau, um, sort of the sister city to Hong Kong uh, on the China Sea there. And they've got 21,000 people per square kilometer. So that's only 15 times as much as those poor fellows in Central Park had. Um, so it's pretty dense. But you can see there is some. Um, green space there. It is a working city, a, a viable city. It is a viable way of living. So let's just do a thought experiment here and say what happened, what if all the world lives evidently as they did in Macau? How much space would that need? Well, 480,000 kilometers uh, square, uh, squared. Now you can see what I've done there. I've factorized that into my favorite number 40,000 by 12. So you can imagine that as being a ribbon city stretched around the world, only 12 kilometers wide. So think about this for a moment. Even from the center of that, you could walk six kilometers, what's that, uh, two hours walk, and you'd get to the edge of this, this city, and there would be nothing between you and the pole. Of course, there'd be farms, there'd be everything that we need to, to sustain ourselves, but in terms of people, we could put everybody in the world into a 12 kilometer wide strip around the world. But of course, we don't want to live at that level of density that they live in, in Macau. Um, you know, what for good or for bad, we've chosen to live in, in England, um, where the density is about 420 per square kilometer. So that's about 50 times as much space as the inhabitants of Macau have. And those 10 billion people would need around 24 million square kilometers. And again, I'll factorize that, 40,000 by 600. And so we get, let's say, a belt nation there. So a country, it's about the same north to south as the length of England. It's about the same as Ecuador, which is on the equator. Um, and again, it's, you know, that would have space for the lake districts and the national parks and the cities and the suburbia. And no more than 300 kilometers, half a day's drive to get to the edge, and nothing between you and the pole. Now, I'm not going to suggest this is a practical plan. <laughs> but it's just to get these ideas in your head of how much space it takes up. Here's another way of expressing it, 80% of Africa. Everybody in the world could live in that, living at the density that we live in England. Of course, I'm oversimplifying like crazy here. Um, and, you know, 10 billion people, is that a big number? Well, of course it is. 
Does the world have space for 10 billion people? Well, of course it does, but that's not, not that simple. You know, we've, we've, we've not talked about distribution of people here. We've not talked about the food that they need, the water they need, the waste they produce. The, what is needed to give those 10 billion people meaningful and fulfilling lives. And really, I'm not here to tell you that you know, 10 billion people is not a problem. Of course it is. There are massive problems there. But until you start measuring the problems, they, become, they are very hard to deal with. Unless you can actually start putting numbers to some of those ideas, you don't have a chance of actually dealing with any of the issues. And I like that quote from Isaac Asimov, great science fiction writer. If knowledge can create problems, it's not through ignorance that we can solve them. So what solutions there come, where will they come from? When we talk about the 10 billion people when we think in terms of problem, the 10 billion people is also 10 billion minds to think of solutions. It's also 10 billion people with inspiration, with determination, with drive. And it's people like you who, where those solutions will all come from. It's smart people. It's people who um, are practical, or problem solvers. It's people who, um, I think it comes down to the people who are numerate. Those are the people who are going to get to grips with the issues and deal with them. And yeah. And it's not just the techies. It's not just guys like you who can grasp the problems and deal with them. But there needs to be a political will. And the people with political power and people with, uh, with financial power also need to be on board to make these things happen. And they need to be persuaded. And they need to be persuaded sometimes not through big data, but sometimes through little data, sometimes through little points that they can focus on, that they can lodge onto, that they can, can rest in their minds. And it's this, this communication aspect, I think, that is very important. Um, you know, the reporters and the journalists of the world, they like to sensationalize things sometimes. And it's a question of trying to ground these and trying to bring these issues to a measurable level to where we can think about them. And sometimes it's complex, and sometimes it's simple. Sometimes it's as simple as asking the question, is that a big number? And really, that simple question is what's behind what's in the book. Um, I talk about various ways of getting numbers in perspective. How do you compare numbers? Ways of thinking about numbers. There's lots of sort of visualization in there. There's stories about numbers. Um, and it's a question of getting our brains around and being able to express those numbers in ways that are meaningful and those that are useful to, to, uh, to people. Um, and yeah, so there we are. That's the book. Um, there's a website. Is that a big number .com? I'm Andrew C. A. Elliott .com. I'm also I've got a Twitter feed there. And those of you who've picked up a copy of the book, I hope you enjoy it. Um, and if anybody got any questions, I'm happy to answer. You, you say it's important to get a grip of numbers and understand and put them into relation, uh, big numbers especially. Yes. Um, how do you suggest we help people do that? Um, because lots of people uh, probably all of us uh, struggle uh, with very big numbers and putting them in relations. I mean, I talk through in the book various uh, techniques. The top one there, landmark numbers, is one that I think is very important. What I mean by landmark number is something that you, that sticks in your brain. You don't set out to memorize it, but it sticks in your brain as a reference point. And I hope that n all of you will leave knowing that 40,000 kilometers is the length of the equator. Um, and that can be a reference number. So you can, when you see that, you may, um, you know, Australia is one tenth of that. Africa north to south is one fifth of that. Um, it becomes something that's in your head that is a ready reference for you to come to, to 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 relate to. And the seven and a half billion people in the world, and there, are, you know, these are numbers which, if you have them ready to hand, 
they help you to make these yardstick comparisons against things that you hear about. And it may be budgets, it may be populations. It's stuff that when you hear something on the news, you, you say, hold on a minute, that's not a big number because it compares with that number in this way. And that's, that's, that's one of the techniques, yeah. Um, you were saying that on your website you have like a database of yes. numbers you compare to. Yeah. Can you tell us what some of them are? I assume one is the 40,000. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, they come from all sorts of things, really. I mean, it's, what I tried to do is to find numbers that would make meaningful comparisons. So some of them are just sort of rut routine household or, or everyday objects, like the size of a post-it note. Some of them are things like... Um, you know, landmarks, the height of the Empire State Building or the height of, um, the, height of uh, the Eiffel Tower or something like that. And then what, one of the things that, I, uh, that is on the website and in the book is I try and find pairs of those numbers that compare in an interesting way. So, for example, the Empire State Building is 5,000 post-it notes high. You know, almost exactly. <laughs> I do the comparison to within 2%. Um, and you get some really interesting interesting numbers that come through. And that has, a, uh, uh, it has an interesting function because it makes you think about the numbers themselves, but it's almost like a triangle. You know, here's the Empire State Building, here's a post-it note, and here's the number 5,000. And it, it gives you a little bit of a feel for each of those points of the, of the triangle when you think about them in that relationship. Of course, it, it, it means nothing in terms of, if, you, know, you know, there's no conspiracy theory here that, that they designed it to fit the post-it note. Um, but it's, it, it's still something that sticks in the mind, um, and that's an interesting way of, 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 of going about it. But yeah, so the numbers, in the, the numbers on the website are, are, are things like the length of the Nile River, you know, the population of Brazil. You know, <laughs> there are numbers that you can compare things to, um, um, and, and that, that's, that's some, that may or may not be intriguing when, 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 when you see them. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk and the book. So. It seems that most of the things you've talked about, at least so far, I don't know if in the book there's more, but it's like about physical quantities that you can kind of compare, like look at one versus yeah. the other. What do you think? Do you think that the same strategies apply to think, things that are more immaterial, like uh, information and so on? Like maybe a few years ago, like thinking in megabytes would have been fine. Now we're talking gigabytes, exabytes, and so on. So maybe it's a different, like, it's almost like unbounded uh, in, in a way, like the, the kind of uh, amount of numbers the size of the numbers that these things require. So what yeah, do you think so, about so that? The, so the first book of the book is, is more, as you say, physical things around us. You know, It's weights and it's measures and things like that. Second half of the book firstly gets into numbers from science. So we talk about how you can visualize or start to grasp, for example, the size of the observable universe. You know, Get there by stages. You know. um, and there's a chapter on information. Um, and we go into things like, um, how do you measure information at all? You know um, how much information is contained in text, um, how much information is stored in physical devices, and things like that. Of course, that part of the book is out of date before it's published, uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, so the, the principles remain. Um, and then there's a chapter on mathematical numbers as well. Um, it's really not a book about maths, but we have to touch on things like, um, you know, explain that that infinity is not actually a number on the number line. Um, or you talk about Graham's number, which is an interesting. You may, you, you know, Graham's number. The name. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's a, it's a number. Um, I first came across it when it was in the Guinness Book of Records as the largest number ever used in a serious mathematical context. Okay, so and Graham's number is just a recipe for taking powers of numbers an unbelievably large number of times. You could not write down Graham's number. The world, the universe, would not have space for it. Um, so the question is, you know, is it even a number? If it, all that it is is a, an algorithm for, for, for doing computation that you could never carry out. Um, but actually, even if I you know, go and buy a coffee and it costs me £2.50, that number, £2.50, is just an algorithm. It's not the number itself. There are some digits there, and we in our heads have the algorithm for turning that into a number. So there's no point of principle difference between the two. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question because, I mean, my family, like half of the kids don't understand math. You know, yeah. I was fortunate to understand it a bit. But um, do you think this, like, understanding numbers should be, have a bigger role in school? Because how math is 
taught in Germany, for instance, is still very, you know, basic. Yeah. And very f on the numbers rather than on what the numbers mean. I think there's an interesting thing here because I think, I think, math is a thing of beauty. Math is math is a, is an abstract thinking skill of of subtlety and profundity. Um, and what we call, I mean, what I call numeracy. Of course, it touches on maths, but it is not maths. It's dealing with numbers. It's the way in which those abstractions of maths connect to the real world. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I'm no teacher. I'm no educational expert. I can't speak with authority on those matters. But it seems to me that we leave behind numbers <coughs> too soon. We move on to maths. And I think that some of the things I've been looking at here suggest to me that there's much more that, that we can do in terms of what I would call adult numeracy, or advanced numeracy, to actually think about numbers into the millions and billions and trillions. Um, and <coughs> there's a shift that happens. I mean, we all, when we start thinking, and at junior school, we're thinking in terms of linear um, numbers, linear scales. But truthfully, the interesting stuff happens when you start looking at more like logarithmic scales. When you start thinking of things in terms of of multiples of each other. Um, and when you, um, the way to understand things like the size of the universe, you can't do it if you're thinking on a, in terms of a linear scale. You've got to think in terms of orders of magnitude, in terms of powers, and so on. And I think that that sort of numerate thinking, I don't, I'm not aware that that's much part of, of, of school mathematics. And I think it's actually very important and it's very useful to think in terms of, 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 of proportions rather than linear scales. Thank you again, and really. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention. <laughs>